in a trend in college football over the last couple of seasons where offenses have been producing absolutely embarrassing statistics on a week to week basis throughout the country, division one football. Saturday's contest between the Miami Hurricanes and the Louisville Cardinals was a breath of fresh air, and it was fun as hell to watch. And as it's been for every game this season for the U, Cam Ward showed up, showed out, put up big numbers, and helped lead them to a thrilling 52-45 to win. This is QB Unfiltered, my take, and my reaction to Cam Ward and the U's huge win versus Louisville. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. Okay, let's begin with Cam Ward. It was, according to a lot of people on social media, a quiet performance by Cam. And all he did was go 21 for 32 for 319 yards, four touchdown passes, zero picks, and he ran for 29 yards. He also displayed all of the great skills and traits that he has in the first six games of the season this year. Poise. He's a playmaker, all right, especially when they need it. He is a great leader, not only on the field, but on the sideline. He's a talented thrower, as we know. Okay, and then he's a escape artist. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the show, but Miami's offensive line is a liability. And with Cam Ward holding the ball too long on a lot of throws, it puts him in a situation where he has to escape a pocket collapsing on top of him. And he does this like Houdini escapes. And he continued to do that Saturday against the Cards. Now, I've selected of all the throws for Cam Ward, the three best throws that he made in this game. Let's start with the first touchdown, his first touchdown pass, which was a 27-yarder. It was in the first quarter. The Canes were down 7-3. to three. He dropped back the pass, got flushed out of the pocket to his left. And he's rolling. He gets his feet set somewhat. He's still drifting towards the sideline. And this is where his skill comes in. He can drift in one direction to his left in this situation and throw an absolute dart, which he did. He threw an absolute dart, screamer, dime to the back line. He had a receiver work in the back line, the back of the end zone hit him right in stride for a big 27-yard touchdown throw. I think that was his best throw of the day. Then we go to the third quarter and the seven-yard out route that he threw to Restrepo for a touchdown put him up 31-17. to Now, let's talk about Restrepo here for a second. I've said this in other shows, Xavier Restrepo versus man coverage absolutely eats up defenders. I say he tools defenders. And man, did he do that on this route. Now, when I coached, when we got man-to-man coverage, I ran what I called option routes, which basically turn into out routes. And that's what this was. It was a seven-yard out route. And it's great against man coverage because if you run the route right, Restrepo did, and I'll explain how he did that, It's impossible to cover, and if the throw is on the money, it's like stealing, right? And so when we would get down in the red zone, and I knew we were going to get man coverage, we almost always, every time, went to this play, and it was easy, pitch and catch. So let's talk about what Restrepo does on this route to get open. First of all, on the release coming off the line of scrimmage, he stems his route inside. So now he's got the slot defender thinking possible crossing route, right? So the guy's backpedaling. He's on his heels, starting to turn his hips to the inside. And then Restrepo sticks his toe on the ground. And now here's where the magic comes in. He stems it now. He's on the outside of the defender, straight up field. And when he does that, He sells the fact that he's going vertical. 
He gets that defender to turn his hips to start to get underneath that vertical route. And as soon as you've got the defender's hips turned towards the goal line on an outbreaking route, he's history. And so at the top of Restrepo's stem, as that slot defender is trying to change direction, he's rocking back on his heels, he's out of position, uh, number seven sticks his toe in the ground and bursts out of the cut, and he's got big-time separation. And I said this a couple of weeks ago. He reminds me of uh, Julian Edelman and Wes Welker. Those guys used to run these types of routes against slot defenders, outside linebackers, strong safeties in the NFL, and they just absolutely ate those guys for lunch. And that's what Restrepo does on this route. Okay, great route. And then Cam Ward, why I say this is one of his best three throws, great feet, great rhythm and tempo. He gets on top of his throw, and he throws a dime outside, shoulder high, a little bit higher than shoulder high. It's exactly where you want the ball, touchdown. And then the third great throw was the little two-yard slant route that he threw for a touchdown. This is also in the third quarter. It put him up 38 to 31. What was so great about this throw is anytime you're throwing a slant route down there, you know, inside the five yard line, that's a, a matter of catching that snap, getting your feet underneath you, rising up and getting that ball out of your hand. It's a bang, bang type throw, right? And then you've also got to put it right on the receiver out in front of him, but right on him, right? To add to the difficulty here, Miami's doing a play action or a play pass or run action look before Cam Ward throws it. So he's putting the ball down to the running back to show run. And because he's got the quickest release in college football, he's able to get that sucker up and it's out. All right. And not only is it's fast and it's out, but it's a perfect strike, right in stride, right where you want to put it, great throw. Those are the top three throws that he made on the day. Now, with that being said, Cam missed some big throws early in the game. You know, they came out slinging the rock, and I'll talk about that more here as we go, but Cam Ward missed some big chunk throws early in the game. One of them was on a middle diagonal vertical or a bender route, but it was deep middle, okay, vertical type route. And on pre-snap, Louisville's got a safety high, and on the snap of the ball, that safety comes screaming downhill because he's going to cover a receiver. They end up in cover zero. There's no safety help over the top now. This is straight man, cover zero. Cam Ward's going to go to this middle vertical route. All he has to do with no safety help is just throw a three, put air underneath the ball and drop it in the bucket and let your receiver go get it for a huge play or a touchdown. Cam puts it on a one. And when you throw deep balls, verticals, post routes on a one, if you're not perfectly accurate with the throw, it's over. Game over. The receiver cannot catch up to the ball, and Cam overthrows him, and he can't go get it. And that's one that I'm sure uh, Cam Ward wishes he had back to do over again. And then there were a couple of uh, seam verticals that he missed where he's like throwing off his back foot, and he's throwing the ball down low into the ground. He's missing low. Those were chunk plays. All right. Those are plays that if he hits their receivers, his receivers are going to run for a big chunk of yardage or they're going to score. And again, you know, those are situations that when Cam goes and watch film of this game on Sunday or, you know, maybe even Saturday night after the game, he's going to kick himself in the butt for uh, missing those throws. Now, I said this in other shows when Cam Ward has all of his mechanics working the right way. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about when he's knocked off platform. I'm not talking about when he has to drop his arm down, uh, change his arm slot to get it around or under a defender. I'm talking about when he's got a 
pristine environment in the pocket where he can take his drop, stride, and throw. And those situations do happen with Miami. They do happen. I've said this before, when he can do that with great weight distribution, great balance, great rhythm with his feet, he's got the consistent arm slot where he gets on top of his throw and throws a dart. He's accurate off the charts, but he doesn't consistently do that. So again, he's in a pristine environment. He can do all of those things that he normally would do. And then he has these situations where he either drops his arm slot down unnecessarily. He's thrown off his back foot unnecessarily. His weight distribution and balance is a little jacked up and the throw is inaccurate and he misses. And that kind of drives me nuts when I watch him play. And that's just a fact. He does that. I, I really think he needs to clean that. Well, I know he has to clean that up moving forward. We'll see what happens. And then, you know, Cam Ward continues to tease me by running the offense. And what I mean by that is, and we've talked about this in other shows and other people have talked about this also, is the fact that at times he will try to make the wow throw or the big downfield throw when all he has to do is make the easy throw and their offense keeps humming, right? So, for example, in the game Saturday, uh, he went through his progressions and checked the ball down to the back, 18-yard completion. And I'm like, yeah. And then there was a part in the game, and this was so beautiful. He dropped back, and it, the rhythm and tempo was so perfect. I can't remember what two routes he was keying first, but his running back was the check down running a check swing to his right. As Cam's dropping, you can see his head go, one, he hits the end of his drop, two, and then he turns and throws the swing, the check swing to the running back. It was perfect. Exactly how Shannon Dawson coaches him to do it. You're during your drop, you're making your your reads, your first guy isn't there, snap eyes to read number two, he's not there, snap eyes and find your back and check it down. Offensive line doesn't come into the play, you don't have to do the Houdini escapes, you don't have to take unnecessary hits. Now, he misfired on the check swing, but that's the type of situation I'm talking about that he teases me with that type of stuff because it, a, a lot of times in the games he will do that but he doesn't do it all the time and that kind of drives me a little nuts okay second play of the game they throw a bender route to the right slot receiver versus cover two rhythm and tempo gets his feet set boom throws a rope bender in grass catches the ball big chunk play and as soon as he did that, I'm thinking back to all of the times that my quarterbacks completed bender after bender after bender versus cover two. And I was also was thinking about the, the offensive guru aficionado Mina Kimes on ESPN saying that you just can't throw the ball versus cover two. And I was also thinking about my guy, Mel Kuyper who actually had the gall and the temerity to say that the NFL needs to think about outlawing cover two because it's too hard to throw against. All right. And then with, with Cam Ward, it has got to be very calming and it's got to be a great sense of security for his teammates and his coaching staff to know that their starting quarterback is always going to be there to answer the bell. He's always going to be there to bring them from behind, to make big plays, to make big plays when they really, really need it, to pick up big first downs, uh, to throw big touchdown passes, and to lead with poise and confidence. Man, you, you take his physical ability out of the picture in the conversation the leadership and the uh, miscellaneous stuff that he brings to the position for Miami is, is really special. 
And those guys, I mean, that just boosts confidence, not only with the offensive players, but the defensive guys as well, and everybody concerned. Okay, some thoughts on the game. Before we start talking about X's and O's, I need to talk about the TV analyst for this game, Jordan Rogers. He's Aaron Rodgers' little brother, quote-unquote backup analyst uh, for the game on Saturday. Jesse Palmer uh, is their, quote-unquote, starter, their number one guy. And Rodgers was stepping in. This dude's good. He is really, really good. You know, watching him and listening to him throughout the course of the game, it's such a refreshing change from most Analysts. I mean, he's calling out route concepts, individual routes, how the route should be run, what the quarterback's key in, where he should have gone on certain throws. He's able to break down pass protection uh, breakdowns, right? Where the problem was, what they were trying to do with protections, all of that stuff that an analyst needs to provide in these games to give the listener and the viewer the insight knowledge as to what in the hell is actually going on on the field. He's a former quarterback, and uh, he really knows what he's doing. He did a great job. Okay, I'm a uniform guy. This This goes way back when I was a little kid even. And both teams on Saturday, they nailed the uniforms. It doesn't matter what teams you're talking about. When you go all black unis with black helmets or you go all white unis with white helmets, that's a sweet look. Well done, both teams. All right, now, I've got a notepad sitting next to my chair when I'm watching these games on Saturday, and the first thing that I wrote down was they had the camera on Miami's locker room when their players were coming out before the game, and this is what I wrote down on my notepad, body language demeanor, vibe, quiet and focused. And you could just tell, you know, and I was always in tune to this, watching how my guys showed up for a game on game day and how they came out of the locker room for pregame warmups or the beginning of the game. You can just tell. There is a look, there is an aura, there is a vibe when your team is focused and ready to take care of business versus, yeah, they might be a little bit focused, but, you know, there's a little bit too much bullshit going on. These guys were ready to go. It was very, very easy to see. Let me ask you this question. How many personal fouls did the Canes commit in this game? I mean, what have they been averaging for the first six games? Three or four a game? Zero. Zero personal fouls. Now, the announcing crew was saying that the players had player-only meetings in the locker room during the bye week where they got some stuff squared up. That was one of the issues that I'm positive was addressed. And the point was made and the point was driven home And based on how these guys played on Saturday, the point was delivered and understood by everybody. That's one thing if Miami keeps that going for the rest of the season. That's one thing that they, the fans don't have to worry about. The coaching staff doesn't have to worry about, about somebody doing something dumb on the field, selfish, personal foul that causes them to lose a football game. And so... You know, that was pretty apparent that they were dialed in for this game. Now, coming off a bye week is tricky. All right. And it's, uh, it's really challenging for coaching staffs. And it's interesting to watch your team, your favorite team, whoever, whatever your team is to see how they respond their first game out of a bye. There are coaches that are successful you know, throughout their career that are absolutely horseshit coming out of a bye week. In other words, their team comes out and plays sloppy, lousy, and they get their butt kicked. And then there are other teams that come out of a bye and they're ready to roll. Miami fits into that category. And so you think about it, these players 
and everybody involved in their program, they get into a rhythm during the season. You play on Saturday, you do whatever you do on Sunday, you know, rehab, injuries, take care of injuries, lift, watch game film. Monday is preparing for your opponent, maybe a light practice, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Those are work days on the practice field. Friday is a polish day, walk through type stuff. And Saturday you play and you do it over and over and over. And then you run into a, a, a bye week where you don't have that. It's different. Coaches will consistently, the ones that are smart are going to consistently talk to their team about that. And they're going to try to make by the bi-week practice as close to playing a playing week as possible to keep their players in that rhythm. And then on top of that, you add the challenge of playing a really, really talented Louisville team and you got to go to their house to play the game. So well done for the players and really a great job by Cristobal and his staff. These guys were, like I said, dialed in and, and uh, ready to go out and play and compete. Okay. What did we notice offensively when they came out of the gates, they attacked no huddle tempo spread the uh, defense out with formations. They threw the ball. And as I said earlier, if Cam Ward doesn't miss some throws early in that first quarter, you know, I think they would have put some faster touchdowns on the board, but it was obvious that they came out to make a statement and uh, get after it offensively, which is what I've been pushing for them to do since spring ball, right, was to take advantage of having the best quarterback in the country some really, really talented receivers and running backs, an offensive coordinator that knows what he's doing, and get them more snaps, okay? More snaps equal more touches by these skill guys, more pass attempts for Cam Ward, more points for the Hurricane offense. And Saturday, they came out of the gates uh, full tilt boogie, which was a huge difference from how they came out and played the first half against Cal, where it was like, <laughs> and they were slowly, methodically running the ball and, you know, eating up clock and their skill guys not touching the football and effectively taking Cam Ward out of their offense. So this was kind of fun to watch against Louisville. Okay, Louisville did a nice job of changing up coverage looks. And what you saw them do Saturday uh, a lot was they did a lot of pre-snap stemming. In other words, they would line up in a coverage look and then they would start moving around to give you a different look so that now Cam and the receivers are thinking, 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 and on the snap of the ball, they would either buzz to one coverage or buzz to another coverage, and that makes it difficult, right? They did a good job with that. Now, what's one thing that you can do to help deter a defense from doing that? Well, you mess with the cadence. You do freeze counts and you do quick counts, right? Freeze counts and quick counts. If you go quick count where you get up on the ball, you line up in your formation and Cam goes, go, and you snap the ball, I'm telling you, that's going to get the defensive coordinator out of that stemming stuff like that because you're forcing them now to line up and play what they're going to play, right? The other thing is freeze counts where it's set, go, and nobody moves offensively, and they just tipped what they're going to play coverage-wise. They tip blitzes, you know, where their defensive linemen's going gap-wise. So those are little games that Dawson can play to alleviate the stemming in the secondary coverage-wise. Now, you know, it may be a situation where their receivers and Cam Ward aren't affected by that stemming at all, and if that's the case, then continue to do what you're doing, but that's one way to really stop that. Okay. You know, these are just random thoughts. And again, on my notepad next to my chair, I'm writing down Shannon Dawson, run more quick game and screens. 
more quick game and screens. All right, which leads me to the next point. Uh, Miami's offensive line is a real liability. All right, we've talked about that before. Everybody knows that. What can an offensive coordinator, what can Shannon Dawson do to help his offensive line out? More quick game and screens. Okay, the quick game, obviously, the ball is out of Cam's hands fast. Screens, what do screens do? Well, besides slowing down a little bit of that defensive line pass rush, you will also get defensive linemen now that have to run laterally to chase screens down and you tire their ass out. Tired defensive linemen are not effective pass rushers. Tempo, okay, going fast. Again, that gasses defensive linemen. It gasses defenses, period. Quick counts and freeze counts along with screens. Those types of things now are in the heads of defensive linemen where they can't put their hand in the ground and go, well, I know Cam Ward, his cadence every single time is going to be ready, set, go. And we've got the rhythm of that. And as he says, set, our asses get higher in the air. Our weight gets more on our front hand or that hand that's down in the dirt. And on that go call, we are blowing by the offensive lineman. Now, as soon as you start messing with snap counts, freeze counts, quick count, they're tired with screens. Um, they can't get to the QB because of the quick game. Man, that is, that has an effect on defenses, defensive line, and it helps your offensive line out. And then finally, run the ball out of four receiver sets. Now, they're pretty damn successful when they get in their tight end H-back stuff and they run the ball between the tackles. But when they get in those formations, defensively, you know that you're going to see run game or you're going to see RPO, right? You can run the football just as effectively out of a four receiver set where now you've got that. You can run your whole offense out of that. And now instead of focusing on plug and runs, they got to think about pass rush. They got to think about changing direction and chasing screens. So throwing that run game in out of a four receiver set, mix in your big boy sets, you know, with the tight end and the H back. But all of those things are going to help out your offensive line tremendously. Okay, it's really hard to believe that in Game 7 of this season, Miami's defense recovered their first fumble of the year in Game 7, and it went for a touchdown. Speaking of the defense, and this is a hot topic on social media, their secondary is not very good. Okay. And everybody's covered all the points. You know, one of the things that jumps out at me, these guys aren't very good tacklers. They're poor tacklers. And when you're playing a team like Louisville or you're playing an offense where they get the ball on the perimeter a lot, whether it's through screens or their passing game, the DBs are the guys that have to make tackles out there. And Miami's guys do not tackle very good okay speaking of running the ball the running back for the canes martinez what a load that guy is that um last touchdown run he had that put him up 52 to 38 <laughs> that was a statement run that guy is a beast he is a weapon this has always amazed me uh and it, it's not just the louisville game it's Every game, all games, DBs and even linebackers, but really DBs, it's always amazed me that those dudes try to tackle 230 pound running backs up around the shoulders. <laughs> that touchdown run by Martinez there in the fourth quarter, that great run he had, there was like two or three DBs for Louisville. It was like they were on an e-ticket ride at Disneyland. Okay, now the only way to get a back down like that is you tackle legs and you wrap. When you try to tackle them from the, sh the chest up or around the shoulders, it's not happening. But wow, that guy's the hammer, Martinez. You know, he can bring it. Okay, head coach Mario Cristobal showed some really big cojones in this game. 
two times he went for it on fourth and one. One was from their 25 yard line. And uh, on that play there, their freshman tight end Lofton had a great block. And then they went fourth and one from their 34 and they got it. And this one cracked me up because Miami went three back, tight end, H back, or three back, double tight. All right. They had 11 dudes inside the tackles and Louisville's defense matched it. So you had like a five yard by eight yard rectangle with 22 guys in it. <laughs> it was funny. That's old school football, man. Newt Rockney style right there. Okay. Now the big play right before the two yard slant for a touchdown that ward through the big play to Restrepo that got him down there to the two. Let's, let's talk about this. If football is a game of inches, right? And they were so close to not pulling this playoff. Ward drops back, gets flushed. All right. And as he sets his feet going to the left to deliver the throw, the Louisville guy is like this close to hitting his arm and that ball is not going anywhere. Fortunately for Kane fans, he's able to get the throw off. Now let's talk about the play again. This is versus cover three. Cover three is the worst coverage in the history of football. All right. And Shannon Dawson has got his little list of cover three beaters. He pulled one out against Cal, the, the big 77 yard completion, which was also to Restrepo. We talked about that in my last show. This was another great play design. Okay. So the outside receiver to the left runs a vertical that takes the cornerback, the deep third cover guy out of the picture. And now Restrepo runs a wheel route. So he breaks it on the out route and then wheels it up vertically. So he is in effect running a trailer vertical behind the outside receiver. Well, the first vertical took the corner out of there. As soon as Restrepo turned it up, there's nobody there. There's nobody there. And Ward's able to get the ball to him before getting crushed. And if Restrepo doesn't trip on about the, I don't know, four yard line, he's, he scores on the play, but a great play designed by Shannon Dawson. That was really cool to see. Okay. How happy do you think, uh, division one coaches are that they've got to do a dumbass sideline interview right before they're starting the fourth quarter? So here we go. You know, their offense or their defense. I don't know what the changeover was, you know, when the, when uh, the third quarter ended, but they're huddled up on the field and they're getting ready to go out there to start the fourth quarter. And Mario Cristobal has to walk down the sideline and do a meaningless, irritating, dumb interview with uh, some woman down there on the sideline. So, you know, I would imagine that those guys absolutely hate that stuff and it's really, really needless. Okay, and in a season where replay officials have been clueless on a lot of calls, they got that huge play with Cam Ward right as he's throwing the ball. Was his arm coming forward, making it an incomplete pass, or was his arm not coming forward, making it a fumble? They made the right call. His arm was coming forward, incomplete pass. All right. Now, big win for the Canes. Now they can get back into a normal week rhythm as they prepare for the Knolls. And one thing that I'm going to be interested to see in this game is Miami going to come into this game and play at their level with their focus and the purpose that they need to have to play up here and not play down to their opponent. All right. And what approach are they going to have offensively? Hopefully they're going to let their best offensive player and the best quarterback in the country do his thing. Oh, get the ball to number seven more. All right. If you enjoyed today's show, please hit the like button, pass the word to your buddies. If you want to listen to my take, uh, my insight, my reaction to quarterback play, I appreciate you guys subscribing to the channel QB unfiltered. Drop me a comment. Let me know what you thought of the Louisville Miami game and 
What do you see on the horizon for the Canes Knowles bash coming up? All right, this is QB Unfiltered. And remember, always throw the ball short to guys who can score. See ya. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, although it's your